in this episode of the Ben Greenfield Fitness Show, how to get muscular legs, how to test for gut inflammation, natural ways to increase stem cell production, should you use ice baths and antioxidants after a workout, and much more. He's an expert in human performance and nutrition. Voted America's top personal trainer and one of the globe's most influential people in health and fitness. His show provides you with everything you need to optimize physical and mental performance. He is Ben Greenfield. Power. Speed. Mobility. Balance. Whatever it is for you that's the natural movement. Get out there. When you look at all the studies done, studies that have shown the greatest efficacy. All the information you need in one place, right here, right now on the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. Oh, Brock, it's been a rough, rough day, dude. On me. I'm taking a guess here by the way you sound that you're not in West Virginia. No, we're supposed to be recording this podcast from West Virginia, where I'm supposed to be racing uh, one of the USA Championship race series for obstacle course racing, uh, Spartan mm-hmm. specifically. Uh, and what happened? I raced. I raced last week mm-hmm. in LA. Yeah, that was a stadium First race, wasn't it? Num- number one. I raced last week in LA and I sprained yeah. my toe. I thought I broke it at first, but it was just a really bad sprain. I took off my shoe after the race and like I could barely even walk. And I just have been taping it up and finally got to last night and I called up the airline and had to cancel my tickets. So bummer. That was, was bummer. Plus, I I had two very, very crazy things happen to me because I was in Venice Beach doing three days. I got nearly nine hours of tissue work done. Uh, along with aromatherapy and nervous system tweaking and all this crazy stuff done with these folks at a place called the Human Garage. And mm, I saw your Facebook lives from there. That yeah. looked nutty. It looked painful, actually. You look, you were grimacing something fierce. Well, if you're listening in right now, you can go to facebook.com slash BG Fitness to see the live feed of a two-hour-long podcast I recorded with them after this adventure. Uh, but anyways, that, that that was interesting for me because fascia, as I learned, as we talk about in the podcast, it stores a lot of emotions, neurotransmitters, hormones. Mm-hmm. So my body, I just felt like a like a different guy afterwards. It was really weird. And then uh, and then I went in to see this guy who works with like U.S. senators and pro athletes and presidents and uh, you know like Arabian royalty who does what's called energy work mm-hmm. like really like old like 5000 year old chinese practice of moving chi or life force or chakra around the body i went in and saw him to do a podcast with him which is also right now on facebook live we'll release it later on here if you want the professional version the better sounding one and the better sounding one yeah and so um so when he worked on me i slept for like 16 hours I had the craziest out of body experience I've ever had sans drugs. <laughs> uh, and it, 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 like he was doing like cupping and like moving me in different directions and giving me these exercises to do. And um, just like, you know, not to sound weird, but just like touching me and, and like passing energy onto me. It was really, really strange. And, and I know this sounds totally woo. But anyways, I came back from that experience just drained. Like, like apparently this is normal. You're drained for a few days, and then eventually your energy just like goes through the roof. But even today, I'm a, I'm a little bit sluggish. Hmm. I gotta admit. So that's been my week. That's why I am at home. How are you doing? <laughs> I have nothing exciting to say except that I'm, I'm. Well, we we are recording this in the evening again. So instead of having coffee like I normally would, I'm actually drinking a black currant blonde ale while we record. Whoa, I had a boatload of ale last night, but not to drink. I uh, had some people over. Do you know Katie, the wellness mama? Who yeah, the wellness yeah, of mama course. Yeah. yeah, her and her family are hanging out with us the past few days up here in Spokane. Nice. And uh, I went hunting a few months ago in Kona and uh, bear crawled and belly crawled and 
crawled, crawled, and ran, and sprinted, and walked. <laughs> all the and variations of after, crawling. <laughs> going after sheep at the base of, all, of a volcano there, and I, I shot a, a really nice sheep. Bo shot a really nice sheep, and and you know, said a good little prayer over him. And didn't he didn't see me, so it, you know, it was really like cortisol free meat, you know, and blessed by me as it left its body and went to a happier place. So he's basically like, Whoa, what a lovely day! Yeah, I'm having a lovely day. Oh, I'm dead, exactly. And you know, I harvested all the back strap and the you know, the mutton and the shoulder and even the heart mm. and the liver and the kidneys. I brought it all back. And we kind of ate on that thing the past couple of days. Like, like we made an amazing last night, an amazing mutton. This is speaking of beer that we we marinated in beer and it was like melt in your mouth. Mm. Like all I had last night, like my wife made salad and potatoes and and of course this this meat and you know watermelon salad. I didn't eat anything except <laughs> meat. I just like went straight. I'm like this sheep is mine. I worked my ass off for this thing. I'm gonna eat it up. So that sounds awesome. Uh, I had. I had beer too, kind of like osmotically through sheep. <laughs> it was pre-digested by the sheep. Mm. So that's how it works, right? <laughs> News flashes. All right, go over to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash 373 and you'll see all of this stuff if you happen to miss it somehow because you're not on the interwebs at twitter.com slash Ben Greenfield. If you aren't there, what the hell, man? Come on. You done? I'm done. <laughs> All right. I want to talk about exercise. And I, I, I've been digging into a lot of research on high intensity interval training because there's been a lot coming out lately. And uh, one of the first studies that I noted on it uh, was just, let, let, let's start here, like big picture. This was on Outside Magazine's website. Oh, yeah. And it talks about, this is something I've always like thought, but it's hard for me to say because I'm an endurance athlete. And it's about how running a fast mile is a lot more impressive than running a slow marathon. Yes. Yes. Dude, a thousand I've, times. Yes. I've always thought guys who could run like whatever, a 13 minute 5k or who can run a, you know, a 205 marathon are way more impressive than, and Dean Carnazzi's, I love you. Somebody who runs like 50 marathons in 50 States in 50 days, or who you know runs across the United States barefoot, just because I think there's something to be said for the athletic skill. There's some mental tenaciousness involved with the, with the long stuff, but there's like this this physical skill and athleticism and an and ability to go into a different part of the pain cave that I really respect when it comes to running a fast mile. And this article goes into you know why a lot of these mile runners, just from like a fitness and a mental standpoint, actually really are more impressive than some people who just do long endurance stuff like marathoning. You know, because like a half mile race, that's like a, a two lap sprint where it's like, as I say in the article, an almost all out effort from the gun. Yeah. And uh, it's it's an interesting read. And it's just like one of those things that I think people should stop and think about. It's like, am, am I just out like trudging on the road, burning calories or am I training like an athlete? So not really a study, but an interesting article. Yeah. Nonetheless. No, I've always um, thought that like as you. uh you always hear people saying like, oh, you're only doing a half marathon or I just signed up for the 10K. And they always sound like they're kind of like wussing out or something when they say that. And it's so wrong. If you run a 10K properly, it hurts. It yeah. is. And it's bad. So I, yeah, I love this exactly. article. I totally agree. And, and it's more impressive, in my opinion. Another study on high intensity interval training and heart rate variability. So it's pretty common understanding. And especially if you listen to the show for a while, the heart rate variability is like the gold standard to measure whether you're truly recovered because musculoskeletal fatigue can go away after one or two days. But if you test your nervous system using a measurement like heart rate variability, you, you'll see sometimes it'll stay after a hard workout suppressed for three or four days. And if you push through consistent low heart rate variability training, uh, you can pretty much predict with nearly 100% accuracy an onset of illness or or injury yeah. or something disaster. Something bad. Yeah. Um, so what this study looked at was what happens when you do high-intensity interval training. In this uh, case, eight 20-second bouts. However, the bouts were at 170% Pmax. If you don't know what that is, that's basically the equivalent of 
smoke coming out your ears, turning blue in the face hard <laughs> uh, with much. only 10 That's seconds it. of rest. So this is a classic uh, Tabata set, right? Yeah. So they did Tabata set and then they had another group just do whole body calisthenic exercises instead of the Tabata set. And they measured, um, and this was a warm up and a cool down. It's a pretty tough workout. I mean, a lot of people like eh, eight 20 second bouts, but you try to do eight 20 second true. Speaking of going fast, being more impressive than going slow, yeah. true bouts, you'll be shocked. Anyways, though, what they found was that it only took about 24 hours for the nervous system to actually kind of repair and recover from a really tough high intensity interval training workout. And based on you know a couple of other studies we'll get into in, here in a second on the benefits of so-called hit training, that's pretty cool that you could do it, you know, basically every day if you wanted to, and you would recover. Well, I, one thing I want to bring up about this study is it was done on 23 year olds. Like I, I want to, I want to see them do it. Yeah, on they're the like 23 year old college students. So they were drinking, smoking marijuana, partying. Potentially, but they're still not doing it on like guys like your age or heaven yeah. forbid my age. I, I'd like to see that just repeated on on some older yeah. athletes because I, I can see like their nervous system would recover from anything and a lot faster than, say, mine would. All right. Well, I'll let you write to the study author and tell them that. Done. But thank you for being devil's advocate on that one. It is a good point. Um, I, I think that I think that compared to like hard weight training, though, you know, hit training gives you a lot of bang for your buck. And it's pretty cool that it looks like we could get away with doing it a little bit more frequently. Yeah. Yeah. Even if it's not 24 hours, it's still, I mean, just try it. Like get, get a heart rate variability monitor, download nature beat. I, I have, like I made this, this nature beat heart rate variability monitor, get it. It's at greenfieldfitnesssystems.com slash nature beat and just test for a week. Just like do a Tabata set every day and see what happens. All right. I'll so, do my own damn study. Don't blame me if you croak on the bike. Uh, the, this next study looked at the increase in muscle power and free testosterone in, you're going to love this, mm -hmm. Brock, mm -hmm. 17 male Masters athletes. Yay! Many of them over six years old, 60 plus or minus five years old. They did this for six weeks. And what they did in this study was six 30-second sprints with three minutes of recovery. That's like a classic workout you do to increase what's called mitochondrial density. That other workout that I told you with the, like the short efforts with, lo with short recovery periods, that would be something you'd do more to increase your lactic acid tolerance. This workout would be something that you'd do more to increase your mitochondrial density. Those are two different kind of energy systems for your cardiovascular performance. Uh, and so these were six 30-second sprints with three minutes of active recovery. And what they looked at was the testosterone response to this and the increase in power. And what they found was that even though total testosterone didn't go up much, uh, free testosterone actually increased mm -hmm. significantly. And so it turns out that uh, there, there's kind of another benefit to HIT training in addition to, in this case, mitochondrial density, a little bit of an increase in free testosterone, which, which either means it decreased estrogen or it allowed for, you know, which would allow less, less testosterone to be bound up and not free or it decreased cortisol, which could increase sex hormone binding globulin or, or something like that. And, and in addition, by the way, the, the study also found that, that it increased uh, power significantly, which is not surprising. So there you have it. If you want to increase your free testosterone, there's yet another trick up your sleeve, kind of short hard efforts with long recovery periods. I love it. I'm going to do that yeah. starting tomorrow. Yeah. And then finally, there, there was one other study that, speaking of, of HIT and hormones, uh, high-intensity interval training versus kind of like long, slow training or what they call mild-intensity endurance training on a cortisol response and uh, specifically an ability to decrease cortisol and increase metabolism at the same time. Now, you'd think that the hard training would increase cortisol, although what I just alluded to in that study where yeah. it increased free testosterone, it could decrease it. Well, this study shows that it does indeed decrease corticosteroid responses to training and lead to greater improvements in metabolic rate when, uh, in this case, <laughs> not master's athletes, not 23-year-olds, uh, but rats, rats. Um, <laughs> tiny for humans, in their little high intensity interval training on their little wheels, but they found a, a decrease in cortisol and they found, uh, basically, uh, you know, a, a lot of good things, you know, serum glucose and triglycerides and lipid content in the liver, but 
ultimately increase metabolism and decrease cortisol. And I don't remember the the protocol they were doing on they, this I one. couldn't find Let's it see. in there. They, they had, uh, yeah, it, it was, so here's how it works in the lab. They had a specialized treadmill that has all these different runways on it with two outer covers that keep the rats from falling off, <laughs> basically like bumper guards at a bowling alley. <laughs> That's so cute. <laughs> Apparently rats fall like, off treadmills. Ah! I know, I can see them just bouncing off these treadmills. Uh, surprisingly, their cortisol was still lowered. So they got acclimated to the treadmill for a week. They got to practice on the treadmill for 15 minutes a day. And then they finally did the exercise group five days a week for 10 weeks. So it was a pretty long study. And what they did was they did 30 seconds of heavy intensity with 10 seconds of recovery. So a little bit more like a Tabata set for the, uh, for the high intensity training. I wonder if they just pick them up for the for the brakes, just grab them, and lift them up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> lift them by the scruff of their neck. Their legs are still moving. All right. <laughs> so now that we've talked about uh, torturing rats on treadmills and killing sheep, and we've lost uh, all of our listeners who love animals, except those that love tasty animals, uh, let's uh, let's move on to our special announcements. Special announcements. Special announcements. Hey, you know where I'm going on uh, Monday? Actually, you know where I'm going tomorrow? Uh, I do. Okay. So so tomorrow, I'm hopping on a plane because my buddy, uh, Nick Delgado, he's a really good like anti-aging. He's not a physician. He's like a, He's got a PhD, and he's a, he speaks at all these anti-aging conferences and um, does some cool things. I'm going to do a Facebook Live with him down in Vegas, uh, and then we're going to go see the fight, the Mayweather conor mcgregor boxing fight so when the people are so, hearing this podcast they will already know who won that ooh, fight but we do yeah. not know who won that yeah. fight so no spoilers I'll, I'll do some snapchatting and live tweeting from there and then i'm going to go to miami the next day i'm flying to miami i'm stopping off to get uh stem cell injections with the u.s stem cell clinic which i'm doing a story on and then i'm working on a story for men's health magazine which involves me going to this place called health gain Mm -hmm. and i'm going to get platelet rich plasma injections into my nether regions along with acoustic sound wave therapy to increase sperm count and testosterone and uh, erectile quality and to break open old blood vessels and build new blood vessels and do everything that this health gains company does and uh they're also a sponsor of today's show And uh, anybody who wants to go to Florida and do the same thing I'm doing, you get automatically 250 bucks off and you just text the word gain to 31, 31, 31. You could sit beside me on the stretcher and get your crotch blasted (laughs) with acoustic sound wave therapy too. Uh, Text the word gain to 31, 31, 31. Are you conscious for this entire thing? Mm, Yeah, but you have numbing cream. Mm, num, 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 lovely, num, num, num. lovely numbing cream. Yeah, uh, the Human Charger is also a sponsor of today's episode. I travel everywhere with it. It's in my bag. Like so, if I go back east, which I'll do uh, on Sunday, uh, when it is seven a.m. back east, it's freaking four a.m. for me back home. Right. So if I'm up and around, I'm going to be groggy. I'm going to be tired. I can vastly accelerate my ability to get used to any area of the world that I'm in by simply taking this human charger, putting one bud in one ear, one bud in the other ear, and you just shine it for like 12 minutes. And not only does it get rid of like a jet lag and circadian issues, but it increases your mood and your mental alertness because it causes a release of serotonin and dopamine and noradrenaline. Uh, so it's a cool thing. And yeah. uh, everybody gets uh, everybody gets 20% off. You go to humancharger.com slash Ben. And if you can't remember all this stuff, just go to the show notes. Uh, which are at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash 373. If you remember nothing from this whole episode, just know that I write everything down and take copious notes, myself and Brock. So you go to humancharger.com slash Ben and you use code BFITNESS to get 20% of a discount. Beautiful. What was that? I used my human um, charger every single day last winter because it was so crappy and, and gray and dismal yeah. up here in Vancouver. I just, yeah. every time, every morning, I'd wake up, I'd stick them in my ears, make my coffee, It was like part of my ritual. It really helped. I love it. Smart man. You're a smart man. Qualia, this podcast, speaking of being a smart man, is brought to you by... Qualia! I will apologize, you guys, for Brock shouting. He's off the hook. Just because I'm drinking the... I got my black currant blonde ale. All right. All right, shut up. I need to tell people about the God pill. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Qualia 
makes uh, nootropic compounds that basically have a host of ingredients, like 42 different ingredients from phosphatidylserine to centrophithine to cytocholine to taurine to L-theanine, neurovitamins, adaptogens, neurominerals. They blend all this stuff together and they make the craziest, craziest nootropic compound you're ever going to put into any orifice of your entire body. It's called qualia. Uh, and you can get it with your discount. You just go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash qualia. That's bengreenfieldfitness.com slash qualia. So that one is a good one to add to your arsenal for a day on which you might be a little bit sleepy. And yes, I will probably be taking some before the fight in Vegas because I probably, I suspect, am not going to be going to bed probably for not. the fight. Do they really have 42 ingredients? Is that really the number? Yeah, yeah. it's 42 ingredients. Yeah, and I interviewed them. Because you know why that's significant, right? I counted them all. Why is that Because that's the answer to the life, universe, and everything. 42. Okay, good. Glad I know that. All the nerds out there know what I'm talking about. Okay, it's good to know. that Because I went way over my head. But uh, I think that you and I will both agree on this fact, Brock, because from our conversation part of this podcast, you happen to be wearing a special something around your crotch tell me about i that. sure do and it is so soft and so comfortable made of 100 percent modal fiber that's and made of what fiber modal i believe it's called it's like 300 million times softer than cotton it's my underwear what is it it's actually me undies me undies me undies yeah they're amazing they're so soft they have a diamond seamed pouch that cradles your jewels isn't that cool i'm i'm looking at it right now yeah. Uh, you can get 20% off and free shipping and a 100% satisfaction guarantee on the most comfortable, coolest underwear on the face of the planet with a huge range of styles. You just go to meundies.com slash greenfield. That's meundies.com slash greenfield. 100% satisfaction guarantee, free shipping, 20% off a jewel shaped pouch for your crotch. So there you have it. And they make them for ladies too. So ladies, you're there. Too. Lovely. Uh, a few other quick things, of course, while I'm not in West Virginia, uh, both Brock and I will be in Lake Tahoe at the Spartan World Championships doing some podcasting and racing. Uh, that's September 30th through the October 1st. Uh, September 8th through the 11th, I will be speaking at the Who Wants to Live Forever conference in Reykjavik, Iceland. Iceland. <laughs> um, Reykjavik. Reykjavik, 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 yes. Reykjavik. Uh, October 13th through 15th, the Biohacker Summit in Helsinki, Finland. Get Helsinki. Helsinki. Get your tickets right over at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash 373. November 10th through the 13th, I'm putting my whole family on a plane, and we're going out to the Weston A. Price Foundation Conference. Amazing conference. Yes, they have tracks for children. They have tracks for adults. My wife's doing a cooking class. I'm thank goodness for all the people there not doing a cooking class, but I am giving a lecture. Uh, and uh, then December 7th through the 9th, you can join me in Kauai, Hawaii, along with Laird Hamilton and Gabby Reese and a host of other little celebrity superstar athletes for pool training and underwater workouts and a crazy good time. Uh, and then finally, join me in Panama December 11th through the 23rd for the amazing Runga Retreat. I gotta get you down there sometime, Brock. It's a good time. Didn't I think Joe told you it was just called Runga? Okay, just, just straight up boring old Runga. Okay. I was really disappointed in that. Okay, well, Runga. Anyway, come on, Joe. Uh, you get tickets over at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash three seventy three. I've got all your discount codes, your guys's hookups over there. So all these places, dude, they're amazing adventures. You only live once. Totally. Come join me in these places. I'm fun to hang out with. Sometimes I promise. So come on out. Most of the time. Most of the time. All right. Let's answer some questions. Listener Q and A. Hi Ben, my name is Luke. I have been following your podcast for a long time um, and listening a lot to uh, your episodes about Psalms and reading your articles. I've had a sticking point throughout my training career, which has been my legs. I'm quite tall and it's uh, pretty hard uh, for me to put mass on my legs, not for a matter of trying. So I've been thinking of maybe doing a cycle of Psalms um, and I was wondering what approach you would take to the training just to focus on building mass in my quads um, whilst on the uh, on the Psalms. Thanks for your help and keep up the good work. 
Now, when Luke says he's quite tall, well, how tall do you think he is? I don't know, but I was quite tall, and I was a bodybuilder, and I had me some nice legs. You were quite tall. Yeah. Uh, so I'm 6'3", and I got long, long limbs. I had to work hard on my quads and my hammies, my booty and my calves. And I was, you know, I got skinny little calves and skinny little legs, just the way the Greenfield men are built. Um, unlike my wife, who she's like at sprinter's legs. Like if she does squats for a week, her her thighs just like oh, they look so great. They feel a lot of pain. Popping. Popping. Um, Popping. Anyways, though, so getting big legs. Uh, first of all, Luke, you ask about SARMs and SARMs are SARM. selective androgen receptor modulators. They're they're pretty interesting. I've written some articles that I'll put links to in the show notes for you. But the long story short is that they can have some pretty significant effects on muscle and strength, good effects on muscle and strength, similar to what pro hormones would give you or anabolic androgenic steroids would give you, uh, like pinch me, I'm not even training and I'm seeing losses in fat and increases in muscle. But at the same time, these things are either a relatively new to the market because they're just basically, you know, think of it. The very first one was, was researchers modified the chemical structure of the testosterone molecule, right? And they just made kind of a different type of molecule that acts uh, similarly to testosterone without creating a lot of the issues with like shutting down the body's endogenous production of testosterone too significantly and without replacing a lot of the testosterone receptors uh, by binding to those receptor sites um, and also without necessarily having quite as big a, a ball shrinkage effect. <laughs> now, the problem is that many Wait, of is them... Wait, quite as big? Yeah, many of them can enlarge the prostate... Uh, many of them, it appears, can be slightly carcinogenic, especially in rodent models, granted at high doses, but still. And, of course, many of them are banned by NCAA and WADA and the International Olympic Committee, so you want to be careful with these if you're an athlete. And then, finally, there might be some liver toxicity concern, um, less than hormones, less than anabolics, and possibly a little bit of aromatization into estrogen. But again, less than hormones, less than... Um, than in testosterone and things along those lines or an, any other anabolic steroid. Uh, however, if you use a good dosing protocol and a good cycle, then it doesn't become as big of an issue. So, and they've got great names. They sound like characters like robots out of Star Wars, like GTX 007 and GW5919 and MK2866. And if you look at a lot of them, um, you see that the, you know, the idea is you would, for example, you take it for eight weeks or 12 weeks and then get back off of it and do what's called post cycle therapy, you know, using like herbal testosterone supports, aromatase inhibitors, et cetera, to ensure that you don't build up too much estrogen or, or get to, you know, kind of too, too much of a cut in testosterone. But again, like a lot of them do your research before you take any of them. If I, if I could speak to any of that seem to be really popping as something that seemed to be highly selective for androgen receptors and don't significantly affect sex hormone binding globulin or aromatase or prostate. Probably the two best that I would recommend for strength, there's one called BMS 564. And the mm. pharmaceutical company Bristol Myers Squibb is currently using it as like an anti-aging to treat age-related functional decline. Or they're, they're, uh, that, that, that's where it was originally developed. But you can get it on other like SARMs websites and, and go read the article that I wrote to, to kind of catch up on what websites are out there. Do you mean they're using it for like to, to stop sarcopenia? No age-related functional decline like uh, like uh, sarcopenia. Yeah, I yeah, think okay. I think cognitive decline as well though that they're oh. doing this one for. But it doesn't seem to affect sex hormone binding globulin, aromatase, or prostate, and seems to be more potent than testosterone in stimulating muscle growth. So that one's called BMS five sixty four. That's an interesting one. Another one that I really like in terms of not having a lot of side effects but being really efficacious, specifically for fat loss and metabolism. It's like called the exercise in a pill. SARMs, it's called Carterine or GW5015. That's another one that uh, is like, you know, it's it's more like a huge increase in endurance or anything related to like high intensity interval training. Really nice, nice little SARMs. But you, of course, you have to train. And you, with any of this stuff, you still would would be uh, would be um, advised to train. So some of the best training tips that I can give you for getting more muscular legs. Um, one would be Dan John's approach of really yes. high rep squats. We're talking like 20 to 60 rep ass to grass squats, like barbell on the back. 
So that's that's one good protocol. And you can check out Dan John's Mass Made Simple for that one. Um, an, another one that you really want to focus on is, uh, and, and this was something that I did a lot to, to get big legs, and it's not great for functional athleticism, but it's great for mass. And that's what's called strip set leg presses. Mm-hmm. where you would you would start with a weight and when you get to the point where you know so so let's let's use a plate on each side for example so you would you do a set of let's say 10 leg presses with a plate on each side then you'd rest and you'd add like a 25 pound plate to each side you do a set of 10 and then you take off those 25s and you put a pair of 45s on and you do another set of 10 you continue doing that until you fail to hit 10 reps so that's an example of of basically like like a like a strip set leg press that would be basically like building up in terms of your strip. And then, and then what you can do is you can work your way back down, stripping weight off. You just keep removing weights and kind of repping out. So, which is also a great one to do for your biceps too. That's a really helpful for that. Yeah. You get to the weight where, where you can't hit 10 reps and then basically you take the 45 pounds off and you do as many as you can. Then you take the 25s off, you do as many as you can. So you get to the point where you just like, you know, look like a little kitten on there moving barely any weight at all. Your legs are shaking and you're barely moving anything. Yeah. Another one would be, um, basically choosing the right type of workout for your body type. So in people with long limbs, uh, it, you, you know, and, and, and what we're talking about are like long limbs, long femurs. In many cases, it works pretty well to target the quads by not just having the weight on the back, but incorporating weight on the front, like two kettlebells racked up on you know, the, the front of your body and doing your squats that way, or a, a front racked barbell squat or, or a, a front barbell squat, that type of thing. So think about putting the weight more towards the anterior of the body than the posterior, especially if you're taller. And that's just, it's basic biomechanics. I don't want to get into it too, too deep into the biomechanics, but the idea is that that puts your, your lever at an advantage to target the quad a little bit more. And the longer your limbs, the, the better of an effect that's going to be. That is really interesting. So it's basically just changing your center of gravity. Mm-hmm. Yep, exactly. Cool. That is so smart. And then the last thing is... You want to, for your quads especially, and, and you know, I know a lot of times this is not a functional exercise and it's frowned upon quite a bit, but it does really help with getting monster quads especially, and that's the, the leg extension machine and yeah. really working that in and even like supersetting like squats or deadlifts with the leg extension machine to work the quads to failure afterwards. And when you do that, you want to turn your toes out. Turn your toes out, outwards rotation, and that tends to stimulate the quads a little bit better. So that's another thing that you can try. Now you're turning your you're turning your toes out, but you're turning out from your hips, not yep. from your ankles. Yeah. Just so people know, so you're targeting those inside, like the inner thigh muscles. Yeah. By by exactly. rotating out from the hips. Yeah. Yeah. Your Jane Fonda's it's, baby. I didn't want to see it's a whole bunch of people sitting there trying to figure out how to make their toes point out to the sides. Yeah, everybody's listening to the podcast and on their leg extension machine, <laughs> scratching their head. Um, and then finally, I'll put a link for you in the show notes, Luke, to an article that I wrote on how to naturally increase growth hormone using things like colostrum and dairy and milk and amino acids. It would be helpful for you to read that too, because you know, again, you know, SARMs are kind of like a fringe supplement, and colostrum, dairy, uh, different forms of milk different growth hormone precursors, uh, amino acids, things like that. Those are a little more straightforward, a little bit closer to real food, so to speak. So check out that article too. I will put the link to that that hormone article if you go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash 373. I just want to ask one quick thing before we finish this is one of the problems I've seen with SARMs, and I'm not saying that I've tried them, but I may have tried them, is that as soon as you stop taking them... You're asking for a friend, you mean? Yeah, I'm asking for a friend. As soon as you stop taking them, you basically start seeing the, or you start noticing the losses. Like you really have to keep taking them in order to to maintain mm. those gains. That you, you need you need better post cycle therapy. Then that that shouldn't be happening. So mm. with good post cycle therapy, that should be a, a non issue. So yeah, that's that's one of those things where, for example, I'll put people on a one two combo of something like uh, aggressive strength, which is an herbal. Uh, testosterone support that we have over at Greenfield Fitness Systems. And then we'll combine that with uh, something called estrogen control, which is like the the estrogen version uh, the, or the, the the one that blocks the aromatase inhibitors. So, mm. so yeah, there you go. All right, I'll, I'll tell my friend. How does one know they have gut inflammation? 
I'm reading this article about coconut oil. I've recently been on a ketosis diet and had great success. But as of late, I've been having gut fat and gut inflammation, and it's really counterintuitive to the progress I've been making. I'm wondering if coconut oil was part of the issue. Yeah, coconut oil is interesting stuff. It's it's not necessarily all it's been cracked up to be. There's a dark side to coconut oil. Dark side. To the dark oil. side. The dark side of coconut oil. No, I mean there there there's like over 1500 peer-reviewed scientific studies that show that coconut oil is healthy, but there are a whole bunch of other studies showing that coconut oil is, you know, it's not necessarily the the panacea that we've painted it to be. And it's not just because of the saturated fat either. It's a whole bunch of other things. No, it's really not much to do with the saturated fat at all, unless you have like familial, you know, hypercholesteremia or something yeah. like that. Um, it appears to have an impact on on T cells uh, within the body, and these drive numerous autoimmune diseases and can uh, cause aggravation of intestinal bowel disorder or gut inflammation or multiple sclerosis. And it seems that excessive intake of coconut oil seems to increase uh, specifically the number of T cells that differentiate into these what are called Th17 cells that can do that. And so uh, that's that's one thing that you'd want to be careful with. And uh, the mice in this study were fed about a 30% fat-based diet, and about 13.5% of that was uh, a type of, of acid, uh, lauric acid, derived from coconut oil. And so that would be the equivalent of about two heaping tablespoons of coconut oil a day. So it's not like that is far in excess of what some people are doing who are using coconut oil in, in a lot of their feeding. Now, that, that study shows that those high amounts of coconut oil can create rampant inflammation in the gut, but what they found was that they fed the mice uh, what's called short-chain fatty acid propionic acid. Um, that mitigates all the damage. And do you know where you get this, this short-chain fatty acid that combats the inflammatory effects of coconut oil, Brock? Uh, butter? Wrong. Close enough. No. Uh, vegetables. Vegetables. No. No. So a, a, a high-fat diet, you know, if it's just a high-fat diet, you just kind of a thumbs down on it. And I'll put a link to an article I wrote called The Dark Side of Coconut Oil that really delves into the science of this, if people want the science. Uh, and a high-fat diet mixed with a high intake of nutrient-rich, short-chain fatty acid-inducing plants is a little bit more of a thumbs up. So I'm not saying coconut oil is unhealthy, but you want to accompany it by you know, eating your, your friggin' vegetables. So that's, that's something <laughs> that's to, always good advice. to bear in mind. Now, when it comes to your question about inflammation... Yes, there are a variety of tests that you can get to look specifically at gut inflammation or the presence of inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, there's some very interesting studies on this, like there's one called the role of and utility of fecal markers in inflammatory bowel disease, and I'll put a link to that study, but it goes into a relatively recent study that goes into a lot of the different uh, biomarkers that are going to give you the biggest uh, insight into whether or not you've got inflammation. One big one is called calprotectin. Calprotectin, and that's measured by what's called an ELISA test, E L I C A, mm. an ELISA test. It's a blood test, and that's a good measurement for gut inflammation. So that would be one. Another one is lactoferrin, and lactoferrin, that's like an iron binding protein, and that one seems to also be significantly increased in the case of irritable bowel disorder or gut inflammation. Uh, there's one called neopterin, neopterin, like N-E-O-P-T-E-R-I-N. That's another one that appears to be released as a marker of a cell-mediated immune response that could occur in the inflammatory process. And this would be specifically one to be elevated if your inflammation was related to your, your coconut oil consumption. Hmm. Um, hemoglobin is another, what's called fecal hemoglobin. Uh, that's pretty similar to calprotectin in terms of comparable diagnostic accuracy, for looking at inflammation. Um, there are some peroxidases that you can measure. They're called myeloperoxidases. Those are proteins, they're called liposomal proteins, and those get released uh, during gut inflammation as well. Um, and then a couple other that you could look at, uh, I know there's a, there's a lot of different markers, and I'll tell you a, a test that would work out pretty well for you. Um, but a couple other ones that you would wanna look at would just be a basic measurement of interleukins. It's called a IL, it's called an IL-23R test, and it measures kind of like your gene susceptibility to, to increased production of interleukins. Um, HSCRP, 
or C-reactive protein. And that's, mm, that's considered yeah. one of the most important proteins in acute inflammation. The problem is a lot of athletes have high levels of C-reactive protein. And it's not because they have gut inflammation, it's just because they worked out the day before. All right. Yeah, so, that's just overall inflammation yeah. everywhere. So. Yep, exactly. Uh, and, and probably another one that I would look into would, one, would be one, this, this one kind of sounds like a SARMS, called S100A12. S100A12. It's got a high sensitivity. It's easy to take. It's easy to detect. A lot of doctors can run it for you. It's cheap. And uh, that's, a, that's a part of the calcium binding family. And that one also participates in a lot of pro-inflammatory processes. So that would be another to look at. Now, there are a host of other things from lipopolysaccharide binding proteins to uh, nitric oxide to what's called substance P to thrombin fibrinolysis inhibitors, a whole bunch of other ones you can get. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll link to a couple of good studies for you in the show notes over at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash 373. Uh, but then I would also, uh, if you want to, to test, there are a few things I would look into. One would be a three-day gut panel. Uh, and that's just three days of collecting your poo, and that'll give you a, a look at inflammatory markers, bacterial balance, yeast, fungus, parasites, a very good test. I've got three sitting on my shelf right here across from me in my office because I do that to myself every four months to see what's mm -hmm. going on in my gut. Uh, so I just have a whole collection of them here. Uh, there's, there's another really good panel that'll delve deep into a lot of those more fringe inflammatory markers that I just talked about. And that one's called a Metametrics Ion Panel. A Metametrics Ion Panel. Uh, and then there's one that does a full microbiome sequence. I just wrote an article on this one. That's called, that's called Viome. V-I-O-M-E. And if you haven't had a chance yet to go over to my YouTube channel and see the video walkthrough I did, it's a 20-minute video walkthrough of what Viome results actually look like, that'd be a good one to check out. Uh, actually, the guy that developed that company, billionaire Naveen Jain, he, he's like a moon rock collector. Yeah, he's that like, guy's into everything. Yeah, he, he is one of the most brilliant guys I've ever hung out with. Uh, next week, I'm actually hopping on a plane and fly over to Seattle to spend time at his house and kind of look more at their scientific process and talk to some of his chief scientists and probably record a podcast. Really interesting guy. But I like what he's doing with full gut microbiome sequencing. So that would be another one to look into. It would be this Viome panel. And then finally, I've been shocked at how accurate uh, energetic frequency measurements can be at uh, showing which areas of the body tend to be inflamed. And I've been beat up and injured in certain joints and done a, an energy scan with something called a NES system, N-E-S. And I'll link to a podcast that I did on that in the show notes. And it would show like, like if I did the scan right now, it would show that my big toe is super inflamed. And it just does that by sending a frequency through your body. And as soon as it finds areas where there is a lack of flow or like a blocked meridian or blocked energy pathway, uh, it, it feeds back into the machine and it highlights all those areas and then you take the little scanner that it comes with and you just basically hold it over that area to accelerate healing and to target over and over again to, to fix the healing. My problem is I wasn't traveling with mine. And so considering I just got back last night, I was able to do like zero treatments on my, my big toe. But that's a good, that's a good uh, one as well. It's called NES. And I'll link to that in the show notes. So uh, I think that'll give, uh, give Chris plenty of direction to start. What do you think, Brock? Uh, I think that's great for Chris, but I think everybody else listening might be curious as to why Chris would be worried about gut inflammation. What is the problem if your gut is inflamed? Your poop is like liquid Coca-Cola. You cough up blood. No, you don't cough up blood. <laughs> no, you, don't, you don't digest food efficiently. You don't absorb or break down proteins efficiently. You don't absorb fats efficiently. You can get increase in blood glucose and increase in cortisol chronically, which can cause other issues down the line. Uh, you get bloating. You can get gas. Nobody wants to be the person on the airplane farting. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of a lot of issues. But ultimately, because your gut brain connection, you know, there's a pretty significant cognitive effect as well. So. Yeah, a lot of a lot of issues that that would uh, would would um, or should give you pause when it comes to asking yourself whether or not you have gut inflammation and considering doing some of the fringe tests we just talked about. Hey Ben, I'm trying to increase my body's stem cell production. Does algae help in this area? I love this question. Because I am a big fan of stem cells, those little buggers that can <laughs> turn into any other cell and repair joints and repair heart tissue and grow new limbs and make your 
crotch bigger and do all sorts of very cool things. I'm actually getting there. stem cells injected into my in, into. Can I say this on the show? My dick uh, next mm. next week, along with those platelet rich plasma. Classy. So classy. So where are they getting those stem cells? Are they pulling them out of your fat, out of your bone, out of out of where? A really buff rat. Mm. So you're going to get liposuction. Sweet. Liposuction. Yeah, if they can find any fat on me. Um, anyways, oh, though, so you don't have to go do some fringe stem cell injection, even though that would definitely be one way to increase stem cells. Um, a few things that can increase it. That, well, let's address the first one Warren asked about marine phytoplankton. Now, that's a microalgae single cell organism, and I've written some articles on it on marine phytoplankton. And the idea is not only is it very high in what's called superoxide dismutase, uh, which appears to be more potent than vitamin C when it comes to having like thousands of times more potent than vitamin C when it comes to helping to to slow the process of cellular degradation uh, to to help cells to repair, you know, in a similar way as, as stem cells would. But also marine phytoplankton appears to have a pretty significant effect on stem cell production themselves, meaning that it can actually increase your endogenous stem cell count. And it's one of the few things on the face of the planet that can do it. Now, I don't have time today to do it, take a deep dive into marine phytoplankton, but you just want to make sure it's grown in a non-contaminated environment, just like algae. It's a bioremediant, right? So it gathers up heavy metals and plastic chemicals and radiation from nuclear fallout. So you want to make sure that you get your phytoplankton from the from the proper source. But ultimately, phytoplankton is a biggie. I'm a, I'm a big fan of phytoplankton as one way to naturally increase stem cells. So, so take your little stem cell label, put it on your pantry shelf, and put a bottle of marine phytoplankton up there as, as the first thing that you'd have in your stack. All, All right. right. All right. And the next one would be aloe vera gel. You can get 100% pure organic aloe vera gel and have like a aloe shot of that vera. a day. I talk with Sean Stevenson. Go listen to my episode with Sean Stevenson. It's called Lightning Speed Healing Hack or Overpriced Fad, What You Need to Know About Stem Cells. And we talk a lot about aloe vera gel, and he used that to like regenerate his spine. And that's another one that can cause a pretty potent increase in, in stem cell production. You can just get that off freaking Amazon. So, And you're talking taking it internally, not rubbing it on your sunburn. Mm, you could rub it on your sunburn, too. You could do you that. Could. Yeah. yeah. A lot of things you could do okay. with aloe vera gel. Yeah. So uh, uh, colostrum would be another, uh, which is the, the first part of mother's milk that comes out of the tiny teat. Uh, don't worry, when it's harvested, there's still plenty left over for the baby goat or the baby cow or came from. But colostrum would be another way to do this, like taking some colostrum each day. Chlorella, marine, speaking of like marine phytoplankton, chlorella, not quite as potent, but kind of a, another one you could throw into the mix because chlorella is, of course, chock full of chlorophyll which has some other really cool effects in the body. So that would be another one to, to toss into the mix. I just interviewed a guy named Darren Steen. I haven't released it yet, but we talk a ton about stem cells in that particular podcast. And there were three things that he really highlighted. Uh, one was what's called brewable coffee fruit. And you can get that on mm. Amazon again. It's called coffee fruit extract. for And, and that increases what's called totipotent stem cells, which are some of the better stem cells that you can get as far as being able to work on just about any tissue in the body. And then the other two that, that he talked about when we had a, we had a discussion, and again, that podcast isn't out yet, but I'm just kind of pulling back the kimono for you. Uh, Moringa, Moringa plant extract, and also resveratrol, resveratrol and Moringa. So there you have it. That's what you would have. You have phytoplankton, some aloe vera juice or aloe vera gel, like organic 100% aloe vera gel, colostrum, chlorella, and then uh, your moringa, your coffee fruit, and your resveratrol. So those nice. would be the biggies. Now, and, and, and again, like, you know, there are, if you read an article I just tweeted about how these Silicon Valley execs are, are just studying the heck out of anti aging, it's a hot, hot topic nowadays. A lot of these cats are taking like 80 pills a day, which sounds exhausting. I mean, you can do that in five minutes, you know, with a little bit of water and spread out. Uh, and they're doing that because there's so many things that we've been able to concentrate in our modern era that can improve stem cell production or decrease the effects of aging that it's it's kind of nice to have that little shelf in your pantry you can go to that where you just have that collection of stuff that you use if you do want to, say, stick around on this planet longer or at least 
feel a little bit better during the years that you are on this planet. Uh, and, and there's some other things that support that I'm going to put in the show notes for you that support stem cell production. They don't cause a significant increase in it per se, but they have some similar effects. Uh, magnesium would be one. Curcumin is another. A special type of plant protein called Sacha Inchi protein. A special type mm. of tea called Pau de Arco Bark Tea. I've got articles, some references, some resources, all sorts of information for you on those too. So if you go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash 373, I'll put all that there. Oh yeah, and there, there's uh, there's one other thing uh, that yeah. that is pretty easy. And you know what it is? Blue. It's round. Mm. Circular. It's blue, it's round. Circular. Yeah. You can close her. Round and circular. Uh, uh, you've had too much beer. <laughs> and it's blue. Blueberry. What? Blueberry. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Blueberry, specifically like, like, Viagra, like, like high dose, like concentrated blueberry powder, uh, stimulates uh, stem cell production. And they've actually done a study where they've shown that. And that was a study in rats, but we're talking about like a blueberry extract, like really con. You could take blueberries, you could dry them, you could powder them in a blender. That's not hard to do. Any of these fruits you can do, and it makes like a nice dense blueberry powder if you if you dehydrate, just like in a food dehydrator. And you can actually mm. make like a concentrated blueberry extract, and that'd be that'd probably be like right up there with marine phytoplankton, and at, you know for pennies on the dollar. So there's one for you as well. Just make sure you you know get good organic blueberries. So there you have it. Is that because blueberries have resveratrol in them? Uh, no, they have some other like polyphenols and flavanols, and what are called sirtuin precursors that can help with that. So yeah. Mm. And they're delicious. Hey, all right. So in one of your previous podcasts, you mentioned that it's not very smart to do an ice bath and take a bunch of antioxidants right after a hard workout. Um, ice bath because it shuts down your body's natural inflammatory response that happens as part of your body's muscle breakdown rebuild process. And then with antioxidants, you said not to do that because it decreases your body's response to free radicals too much when your muscles are repairing. So when after a workout should I do an ice bath and antioxidant intake? Like let's say I'm doing a heavy lifting session and the next two days I'm going to be sore. Do I wait until the day after the workout to take an ice bath and maybe have a big antioxidant rich smoothie? Let me know. Shed some light on my situation. So this comes down to this idea of a ice baths possibly blunting the hormetic effect of exercise. Mm -hmm. And the ice baths just sucking, in my opinion. Mm. Yeah, um, I kind of I like know, them. It kind of depends when you do them. Middle of the summer after mm -hmm. like a good hard run. Oh my gosh, an ice bath is amazing. Uh, trudging out through the snow in the winter out to my cold pool outside. That's a little bit more of a mental chore and stress resilience. So, yeah. anyways, so yeah, I have said that it's smart uh, not to take an ice bath and a bunch of antioxidants. Or, or, or to, you know, like right after a workout, right after a hard workout, because it can reduce, it can blunt your ability to produce antioxidants, to produce heat shock proteins, to uh, Wait, no, to produce increase, produce oxygen. protein synthesis, no, to produce antioxidants, endogenous antioxidants like glutathione, et cetera. Oh, okay. When you when you do an ice bath or you take a bunch of antioxidants after a workout, you kind of blunt your body's ability to be able to repair and recover itself. And you also blunt some of the response to exercise, some of the positive response to exercise. Uh, however, of course, I, there's some evidence showing that cold exposure ice baths, especially when combined with pressure, like compression garments or, or something that, you know, like being underwater, which produces some hydrostatic pressure versus a cryotherapy chamber, which is cool, but doesn't do the same thing as water. Uh, but uh, cold combined with pressure seems to really help with recovery. And then antioxidant supplementation with a good full spectrum antioxidant, not just synthetic vitamin C or synthetic vitamin E in high doses, but like really good, like full spectrum plant extracts and antioxidants, you know, from a variety of antioxidant sources like turmeric and ginger and the blueberries we just got done talking about and cayenne and cinnamon and all these things that are natural antioxidants. It appears that even high intake of those can potentially blunt that hormetic response to exercise. Uh, even, you know, something like uh, curcumin, probably one of the most potent, one of my favorite antioxidants. It, it can do that. So um, based on that, uh, in the literature that I've seen, in most cases, we're talking about acute exposure to the ice bath or to the antioxidant smoothie, right? Like you 
put down the barbell, you wander in the locker room, you take your cold shower and you mix up your shaker smoothie with little springs inside of it that mix everything up. Or you, uh, Mm -hmm. you finish a hard bike ride and you just go jump in the cold river and go straight to your handfuls of berries and fruits and nuts and seeds. Uh, it appears that that's not so great, but if you wait for a little while, just like if you wait for about two to four hours after a workout to eat, you get an increase in growth hormone and an increase in mm. testosterone from a post-workout fat. If fast, if you wait for two to four hours plus after a workout, after your body has already cooled down, after you after you kind of feel, I mean, you can go by feel. Like it's it's like my metabolism has slowed down and my body is no longer feeling as though it's fighting a line and I'm out of workout mode. That's when it would be an okay window to, and there's no hard and fast studies on this, but but it appears that it's the acute exposure that that blunts the response. But it's after it's been a little while, after your body's kind of had a chance to fight for itself to recover, then you could go do a cold shower later on in the day, right? Or or, or earlier in the day, you know, if you're doing like an afternoon or an evening workout, uh, or you take your antioxidants, you know, at that point, two to four plus hours later. So really simple. It's not like you have to wait days and days. It's just a few hours. It's basically when you get to the point, the way that I gauge it is it's like when I'm finally kind of hungry again and I'm not breathing hard and I'm not sweating and I'm just kind of like out of workout mode and feel like I did before I started the workout you know, that that's when I will be ready to do some some more intense recovery protocols so pretty pretty easy really yeah that makes sense yeah. it's kind of the time when when the pump is starting to dissipate from your muscles yep yep you know, when you, when you don't want somebody taking a picture of you anymore, you know, you come out of the gym and you're like, somebody should do a selfie. Yeah, I do a lot of stuff. After a couple hours, you're like, nah, maybe not a selfie. Yeah. Um, hey, do you want to give some stuff away? I always want to give stuff away, especially when it's your stuff. All right, cool. Because somebody, don't give my somebody just away. won an amazing review or they won an, they did an amazing review and they won a gift pack. They so did. if you leave a review on iTunes... And you rank the show and you hear your review read on the show, you get a gift pack sent straight to you. All you got to do is email your t-shirt size to gear at greenfieldfitnesssystems.com. That's gear at greenfieldfitnesssystems.com. Uh, Brock, uh, this one's really long. Do you think you can handle it? Yeah. You want to take this one away, man? I, wait, I, I need a sip of beer first. Just so. Okay. Uh, take a sip of beer and then read this review for us. All right. It is by Lynn Baum. And the title is Vaporizing Tea with five stars. Hmm. Here we go. Are we talking you put it into a bong? That's the whole review. That's the whole review. I like that review for two reasons. Number one, they figured out how to ask a follow-up question without actually going to the podcast show notes. (laughs) Totally, yeah. Uh, Smart, smart. And it didn't take Brock long to read, which is great. No. So I can have more beer. Yeah, he stumbles with big words. Uh, Mm -hmm. I think she's referring to podcast 372 where I described this fantastic practice where you can get a vaporizer and some little, some organic, like a good Northern shake tobacco, a few drops of essential oil and your favorite loose leaf tea. And rather than vaporizing marijuana, and you could put some marijuana in there if you wanted to, but you can just vaporize sure. all this stuff and you vaporize it. And yeah, you, you could use a bong or a magic flight box, or there's a really good one out there called a volcano. That's like the, the Mac daddy of these vaporizers and, and yeah, you, you do that and, and it's nice. You're not breathing a lot of smoke, just the vape. And yeah, so that's, that's what you do. There you have it. I've educated so you, you could put it in a bong, but yeah. it's better if you actually use one of the vaporizers. Yeah. So there's your free bong tip for the day. We should just end every episode with a bong tip. <laughs> All right. Well, everything is over at Ben Greenfield slash three, seven, three, the calendar of events, all the links to all the studies that we talked about, all the resources for everything from how to get muscular legs to how to test a gut inflammation for how to increase stem cell production uh, and and much more. So uh, Brock, go enjoy your MeUndies and your beer. Sounds like an amazing night. It's, it's Friday night, baby. I'm going to go eat whatever sheep mutton is left over and oh, check man. out the, uh, the replay of the fight weigh-ins. And then uh, I'm going to go try to survive Las Vegas for the weekend. Careful. That place is dangerous. All right, later, man. You've been listening to the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. Go to bengreenfieldfitness.com for even more cutting-edge fitness and performance advice. 